All right, let's get this started. Um, I am so grateful to welcome you all. Greetings. My name is Karee Peterson-Smith. I am the Michael Ratner Middle East Fellow and part of the New Internationalism Project at the Institute for Policy Studies. And it is my absolute pleasure to be hosting this event tonight with this incredible panel, Displacement Today, Afghanistan, Haiti, Palestine, and beyond. Welcome, everybody. First things first, um, uh, I'm going to get into introductions, but I want to begin by uh, saying that I'm coming to you from Wampanoag and Massachusetts land uh, in the city known as Boston. And the Institute for Policy Studies, uh, where I work, the office is located in Pisc Piscataway land, uh, which include a place known as Washington, DC. And while this is true always, especially in a discussion of displacement, I want to acknowledge the centuries long struggle of the indigenous peoples of this place to resist colonization and to thrive, struggles that continue through this day. Today's conversation is part of, uh, it's the first of a four part series called Displacement, Migration, Borders and Resistance with one event each week of October. And I'll share more about that later today. Our conversation tonight about displacement is incredibly timely. In the US, public conversation and policy conversation about migration tends to be limited to the so-called immigration debate, which includes phrases like crisis at the border or path to citizenship. These things that speak only to what is the right responses to the arrival of migrants at US borders or migrants presence here once they're actually here. But there is virtually no conversation about why so many people migrate to the US and to places all over the world to begin with. Similarly, there is some, though far too little, conversation about the responses of indigenous peoples to their displacement. There's plenty of questioning and condemnation, for example, of Palestinian responses to violence of Israeli displacement, but not nearly enough conversation about that displacement itself. The displacement uh, crisis uh, that we're facing in the world has been going on for a long time and unfortunately it is only growing. This year, however, 2021 has been different in my opinion as displacement, which is largely invisible 
in places like North America has been made more visible to larger numbers of people. In August, for example, the whole world saw the United States withdraw troops from Afghanistan in a, what I would argue is a thoughtless operation that clearly paid little to no attention to Afghans or their lives, um, including Afghans who worked closely with US forces and institutions. We saw desperate Afghan people gather at the airport in Kabul to flee and struggle to navigate US visa processes and otherwise struggle to access refuge in the United States. At the same time, the latest disaster befell Haiti uh, in a really catastrophic earthquake um, that struck. Indeed, as the US was ultimately, I think, uh, pushed into accepting several thousand Afghan refugees, the US maintained its policies meant to keep Haitians out. In Palestine, there is ongoing displacement of Palestinians through violence as Israeli forces uh, and settlers forcibly remove Palestinians from their villages and neighborhoods to settle Israelis in their place, Jewish Israelis in their place. This year has been unique, however, in the attention uh, that Palestinian activists have garnered to the situation in Jerusalem, particularly in the neighborhoods of Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan neighborhoods where Israeli authorities are making big push at ethnic cleansing. And then there was any number of climate change driven disasters that have displaced people. These unfortunately exist all over the world. Many of us here in North America are familiar with wildfires in the West, a catastrophic hurricane that hit the Gulf Coast weeks ago and flooding in the East uh, where I live. Now, each of these contexts that I've kind of um, noted uh, of displacement has unique features and they are affecting people in very different ways depending on who they are and where they live. People displaced by wildfires within the United States, for example, as horrific and heartbreaking as their situations are, they don't necessarily have to navigate international borders. In the case of Haitians seeking entry at Del Rio, Texas, these are people trying to move, they're, they're uh, trying to migrate. In the case of Palestinians in Jerusalem, people are trying to stay, to, to stay in their place. So there's any number of differences uh, in these situations. And yet there's also any number of connections. Haitians trying to access the US, uh, for example, at the US-Mexico border will face technology, border security technology that is Israeli technology because the US and Israel cooperate extensively when it comes to uh, uh, border security and things like that. They will also have to navigate a homeland security regime that is deeply related to the very war on terror uh, context that was the context for the US invasion of Afghanistan, uh, which has produced, helped to produce a displacement crisis there today. And so tonight we have this really incredible panel to look at both specifics of these four uh, contexts and also see the linkages between displacement when we're talking about Haitians, about Afghans, about Palestinians, and about people displaced by climate change. And with that, I actually want to go ahead and uh, introduce our uh, amazing, amazing panel. There's a lot to say about each of these, but I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, Jacqueline Charles is the award-winning uh, Haiti and the Caribbean correspondent for the Miami Herald, um, who, were, who recently was in Del Rio, Texas, where, where Haitian folks uh, were stuck at the border. And I'll go ahead and um, I'll introduce folks and we'll go ahead and get into the discussion. Um, Halima Wali is um, an Afghan American who is part of the group Afghans for Better Tomorrows, uh, which is an organization that advocates for policy changes in terms of the US's relationship with Afghanistan. And I think especially advocates uh, for us to pay attention to Afghans agency in determining their own future. Um, Amina uh, uh, Ode is a lifelong resident of the, uh, the neighborhood of Silwan in Jerusalem. Uh, she is a dentist there um, and she's an organizer too. And it's very late in Palestine. So we're very grateful uh, for her to, um, to, to join us. I'm sorry, Amani Ode, I, I mis mispronounced her name. Um, and then lastly, Josue de Luna Navarro is um, my colleague at the Institute for Policy Studies. He is a fellow. Uh, and he is somebody who has expertise in the question of, of uh, undocumented migration, of borders, of public health, and of climate change, and will be speaking to climate change in particular. So a great welcome to all of you.
Um, and I'm going to go ahead and ask questions of our different panelists, and then we'll have a discussion later. And I want to start with Ms. Jacqueline Charles um, and talk about the situation that's facing Haitians, both in Haiti and Haitians who uh, are elsewhere. So in September, we saw thousands of Haitians seeking refuge in the US, trapped at Del Rio, and ultimately uh, thousands deported. Um, time after time, we've got the uh, we get the story of a crisis at the border, but virtually no conversation about what events lead people to the border. And I was wondering if you could talk about this group of Haitian folks um, who was at Del Rio. Can you talk about that group of, of Haitian folks itself? Um, uh, you know, I understand that there are people who are being displaced in Haiti right now, but there are also Haitian folks who have been actually displaced throughout the Americas. And I wonder if you could just um, kind of narrate for us what led folks to Del Rio most recently, and we can go from there. Okay, well, definitely, I think that you cannot um, separate what's happening in Haiti to the crisis at the border involving, you know, Haitian migrants. Um, you know, initially, some of those initial stories, uh, we saw people were assuming, or a lot, some of my fellow colleagues were assuming that these were people who were coming directly from Haiti because the president had been assassinated on the 7th of July. And then a month or actually five weeks later, we saw this 7.2 um, devastating earthquake along the Southern Peninsula. But in fact, the people that we saw in Del Rio the thousands of, of Haitian migrants um, that were gathered in these, you know, soil conditions underneath this bridge, um, they were coming mostly from Chile and Brazil, a 7,000 mile dangerous trek through South and Central America. And this new migration route actually started after the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. Uh, you know, when that earthquake happened, it was 7.0. It nearly destroyed the capital of Port-au-Prince. Over 300,000 people died, um, homes destroyed. Uh, you know, the U.S. was basically waiting for a migration crisis. Well, it didn't happen immediately. About two years later, we started to see Haitians leaving and they were going to Brazil because Brazil was basically building and saying, hey, we need workers, so come. And Brazil basically um, started to give permanent residency. When Brazil's economy turned, you saw that to step second displacement. So the first displacement was from Haiti from a natural disaster. They went to Brazil. Then we saw a displacement from Brazil into Chile because people really could not survive in Brazil. And then in Chile, we've seen another displacement. And this is what you're seeing at the, at, at the border, um, coupled with the COVID-19. In Chile, Haitians have found it very difficult because of the racism, um, the working conditions. And at the same time, there's this increased competition from Venezuelan migrants who speak Spanish, who are skilled. So they are also displacing Haitians. And so what we've seen now is this track to the U.S. southern border, which actually there was a migration crisis in 2016 that a lot of people missed. And the response of the Obama administration at the time, which was Democratic administration, was not Title 42, but it was to lift a six-year moratorium on deportations back to Haiti. This is how the U.S. responded, by basically massively, you know, deporting a lot of those migrants, you know, to Haiti, uh, to, to Haiti. So here we are now in September and we see Del Rio. Now there's still a lot of questions about how is it that, you know, that camp, which was fit almost 15,000 people at its peak, not all Haitians, but the majority of whom were Haitian, how did all of these people move so quickly in such a short amount of time? Now, when I talk to, to, to the migrants themselves, they're talk, talking about the use of social media and this is how they managed to do it. But, you know, I just filed a story right now about Chile busting a migration smuggling ring. So there are some thoughts, at least by the part of the DHS, that there is some smuggling in that. But you're seeing though, is this continued displacement forcing out. And the question is, so why don't they wanna go back to Haiti? Well, I can tell you since June, there has been the forced displacement of at least 20,000 Haitians um, from a neighborhood in Port-au-Prince, the southern entrance, because of gang violence. That's on top of, you know, tens of thousands of others who are already displaced all year long because of this violence. And that's on top of over 100,000 people who have been displaced for the past decade because of the natural disaster. 
So in Haiti, you are seeing all of these issues that we're seeing globally. We're seeing climate displacement uh, because of the earthquake. We've also seen it because of Hurricane Matthew. That was in 2016. We're seeing displacement because of armed gang violence. And now we're also seeing displacement because of you know either the welcoming mat being pulled from under them or never being extended in the first place. So you know that is how I think that people can think about what's happening in terms of the Haitian migration crisis. And it, finally, you know, in the case of the US and this administration, we are seeing the use of Title 42, which basically allows the United States to basically just you know, put people on the plane and send them back without giving them a chance to say, hey, I wanna apply for um, political asylum and without an immigration officer deciding whether or not that migrant has credible fear of persecution or not, um, that doesn't even come up. It's like, we're sending you back. So since the 16th of September, there's been over 7,000 um, Haitian migrants that have been sent back um, to Haiti by the United States alone. And we are also seeing um, repatriations from elsewhere in the Americas. That's, you know, I'm just grappling with the, the proportions that you're laying out here. I mean, to think of 100,000 um, folks displaced from climate disasters, is that right? Yeah. Um, and then 20,000 from one neighborhood uh, alone, Port-au-Prince through gang violence is just incredible. But I can tell you in 2017, if you just take that one year, 2017, 1% mm -hmm. of Haiti's population, that's 100,000 people relocated from Haiti, the island of Hispaniola to Chile. So these are people who were displaced um, because of you know the earthquake, the deterring political situation, um, they relocated. They moved. They 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 moved to Chile, and that is on top of those who are already there and those who came after. I'm wow. It, I mean, just just to to note, I don't I don't think we have um, I don't think we'll be able to get into all of it, but just to it's just worth saying that when one percent of a nation's population. Uh, is displaced to Chile. That sounds enormously disruptive, but I guess it also speaks to the level of disruption happening in Haitian society um, at the moment. I, I wonder if you can talk about, so, you know, we know that thousands have been deported and these are, so, so I have some basic questions about this. Folks have been deported back to Haiti. Have folks been deported to um, other countries? And yeah. then I'm, I'm curious too, for folks who've been deported back to Haiti, what does that, what does that, what does that look like? And and last, so, last question, just yeah. just, I, I'm also curious about um, internal displacement within Haiti. If you, if you could okay. talk about that too. Yeah. So, um, you know, what we saw in Del Rio, the Department of Homeland um, Security Secretary Alejandro Mayocas was saying from the very beginning. Um, we are going to try and, you know, get some of these people back to Brazil and Chile and other third countries where they were living. There was a recognition on the part of the U.S. that these individuals did not directly come from Haiti. And in many cases, um, especially in Brazil, some of them have permanent residency in Brazil. Well, we have been asking the question, um, how many of the people under that bridge were actually sent someplace other than Haiti. And I can tell you so far, it doesn't look like any of them. Uh, the International Organization for Migration in Haiti told me last week that they've um, registered at least 213, and that's just minimum, um, children who have ended back up in Haiti with Chilean, with Chilean and Brazilian passports, mostly Chilean passports. So what we are seeing is that people who have been living in Chile and Brazil since 2010 or even beyond, I spoke to a guy who had been living in Argentina for 14 years, um, they are being sent back to Haiti, a country that is wrecked by gang violence, armed kidnappings. Just on Sunday, there was a pastor and several of his parishioners were, um, congregation members were kidnapped from inside a church. Um, a country where the president was assassinated and, the, and his own security was not able to protect him. A country that on the 14th of August was struck by a 7.2 magnitude earthquake that basically destroyed over 100, you know, in 30,000 buildings. Yesterday, school was supposed to start. It cannot start because there are 900 um, schools that have been seriously damaged or destroyed along with hospitals. Uh, so what does this mean? This means that inside the country, you also have this internal displacement that's going on. There are people who are being returned, but they're not necessarily from 
the capital of Port-au-Prince. They're from the outskirts, which is usually much safer even if there are no jobs. But in some instances, people cannot go to the South. One, because the road to the South is controlled by gangs that have also attacked convoys that are daily attacking just fuel um, uh, trucks. Uh, so people are stuck inside um, that capital. And because of all of this is happening, we are now seeing another migration crisis. We are seeing Haitians who are ending up on boats and they are being returned from the Bahamas, from the Turks and Caicos, um, because, and even from the Florida Straits by US Coast Guard, because basically smugglers um, and human traffickers have basically been preying on Haitians from that earthquake ravage area saying, hey, I can get you out of here. I can get you to the United States. So they're paying $250 to $500 to go on these rickety, unsafe boats, getting stuck on, on rafts and being interdicted by Bahamian authorities or the US Coast Guard, only to return back to Haiti a few days later. And in many instances, people have, are selling everything they own. Uh, these trips are not cheap. Um, and they go back with nothing. They go back worse than they went. And the impact even in the economy is worse because in the case of Chile and Brazil, the people who left, you know, who spent $4,000 to $17,000 US for these, for these trips, they were supporting families back home. They were sending people to school. They were paying for hospitals. They were doing all of this. And now they have nothing. You see them at the border and their whole life is basically in a backpack. Wow. Um... Okay, there's so much to say here, but I, I wonder if my, you know, my last question is just about actually some of the policy decisions that are made here and in other um, you know, powerful countries and institutions that are, that are related to this situation. I mean, of course, if we talk about the question of the problems that you're describing that Haiti is facing, of course, we have to have a conversation about the past two centuries. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, 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 I, but I wonder if, you know, just kind of in the contemporary moment, I mean, we, we know, for example, that there is some, there is an aid regime, uh, you know, There's in terms aid, of aid. It, to, right, but, but where is it going if, if 900 schools have been destroyed, you know, I, I, I wonder if you could just break that down briefly for, for folks. So there is a, there's a current conversation that's happening and it is about US policy toward Haiti and whether or not, and, and that policy needing to change. And, you know, we saw last week that the US envoy to Haiti, Daniel Foote, who was appointed two weeks after the death of the president, and then you saw him resign. And in his resignation, he pointed out a number of things. It was a very harshly written letter, highly critical of the Biden administration. And he's still a State Department employee. But he pointed out one, what he called the inhumane treatment of Haitian migrants that were being um, returned to Haiti. Two, he talked about sort of US policy or international policy in general in terms of supporting the status quo, supporting people in the name of, of stability. You have on the ground in Haiti a group of civil society that are basically pushing and saying, we want rupture, we want to break with the past. Um, they are not supportive of the current you know, interim prime minister who was named by the president just days before he was killed. Um, but the problem is that it goes back to elections. And, and I think that if we look in this recent contemporary, right, you are not looking at the fact that this was the world's first black republic, the United States refused to acknowledge it. France made it pay uh, for right. its freedom. Uh, right. But and the US occupied it for 19 years and put in place many of the structures that continue to be problematic today. We just look at the last 10 years, what happened? You had an earthquake and the world came together and says, we're going to build you back better um, and we are promising billions of dollars in aid. And contrary to popular thinking out there, this, most of this money did not go to the Haitian government, very little of it. It went to non-governmental organizations. It went to that aid regime. Haiti was once called the Republic of NGOs. Um, and so we didn't, and so you saw very little of it trickle down because people thought based on the rhetoric, either they were going to get a new house or they were going to get a house. Um, and you started seeing issues in terms of land, all of these issues that we know exist in these countries, but instead of seeing a creativity on the part of the international community, you basically saw them give up in the sense that, um, you know, you, 
people who were in tents, they were put into these things called T shelters, temporary shelters. And the third step was supposed to be permanent housing. Well, the permanent housing didn't happen and aid organizations started saying, oh, well, we can't give housing to people who don't own the land and the government hasn't changed your laws and they need to change your laws. So there was all of this. So basically there was the failed promise of, of, of the earthquake of the rebuilding and that forced people out. Instead of getting better, the country has regressed, regressed. And we've seen the role of the United States uh, in particular in the role of the last two elections. Um, in Haiti, they, they, there was the forcing of the election in the midst of an earthquake. And then with that then president, Rene Preval, forcing him to remove his candidate, Jules Celestin, um, at the time, which was a very controversial decision. And that started this whole domino effect. So today, here we are, and we have a group of society that is saying, OK, we're not for this government. Um, we want to go to a, a selection process with applications. And well, Haiti did that in 2004. So you know, I've been asking these people, too, well, what happened to the rupture? Why didn't it happen between 2004 2006? And finally, let me say that we've had the United Nations peacekeeping force that was in the country for 50 years. And while it produced a semblance of stability, what happened? When the UN pulled out, this whole house started to fall apart. So today you have a country where all of the institutions have collapsed. Um, you have the police that cannot deal with the, with the insecurity issue. You have a gang problem that is new, that is proliferating. Um, more than 100 gangs, most of them in the capital. And so this is where, you know, I think you know, when we take away the rhetoric, Haitian-led solution or rupture, the question is, if you've been doing the same policy for, for decades and you're coming up with the same outcome, what is that conversation needs to look like today? And what is the responsibility of Haitians in moving the country forward? And what is the responsibility in the international community that always puts its weight on the balance scale, regardless of whether it admits it or not, but it's always, you know, sort of trying to push this country in a certain, uh, you know, direction. And so that is where they are at. Um, yesterday, I covered a UN meeting and everybody, you know, this is the world global body and everybody's like elections, elections. I mean, if they could have elections tomorrow, they would have elections and whether they meant to or not, what they are, the message they're sending is elections are going to solve your problem when in fact Haitians know and Haiti observers know that the root causes of Haiti's problems always go back to that last election. Wow, well, Ms. Jacqueline Charles, thank you so much for a really um, amazing summary, actually, not only of uh, the displacement crisis, but its roots, um, the history of the, you know, the dark history of the U.S.'s relationship with Haiti and the ongoing problems. Um, so thank you so much for that. I know um, you actually have to uh, go to another uh, thing, so I'll let you quietly get off, but we really appreciate your presence here uh, with us so thank much. You. Um, and with that, I want to turn to um, Halima Wali, uh, who is a member of Athlans for a Better uh, Tomorrow. And we are so grateful uh, for your presence here too. And uh, as we're talking about the question of displacement, which, you know, again, you know, in, in the United States, um, there's so little conversation and so little visibility, I think, um, in, a, in terms of a public conversation about people actually facing displacement. And yet that after what I would argue were largely two decades of invisibility of Afghanistan, um, you know, in the kind of mainstream US public conversation, there became there was a lot of visibility um, uh, in, in August. So, um, so really grateful to have you here. And I want to say, I want to start by saying this week actually marks the 20th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan in 2001. Um, one of the great uh, disasters um, of the past two decades has been, I think, the invisibility um, that has the uh, the fact that that this the U.S. presence, its occupation, has been rendered largely invisible to most of the U.S. population, um, and yet we got you know, a certain kind of visibility in August. And yet that visibility was coupled with kind of, you know, an official American framing of what was happening. You know, we've tried our best, um, uh, look at what, what a great job we're doing, et cetera. And um, I wonder if you could actually explain to us, you know, the US's actions before the withdrawal and the withdrawal itself uh, and those, in terms of shaping the context that was so devastating for Afghans. Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, one thing that's very critical is to understand 
the U.S.'s policy towards Afghanistan, not just in the last two decades, not just in the last 20 years, but I would arguably say in the last 45 years, where the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan during the Cold War era, essentially meddling in with Afghanistan's policies and stuff like that to um, you know, move, push away the Soviets that were, um, you know, gaining ground in Afghanistan. And I think that especially set up the framework or the groundwork rather for what we saw with the CIA and the Pakistani ISI collaboration where they were essentially smuggling weapons and stuff like that into Afghanistan to these various Mujahideen factions. And then what we ended up seeing is that some of the Mujahideen factions ended up becoming what we know now as the modern day Taliban. And so you can really see how that full circle uh, you know, policy came about. You know, we're looking at policies from the late 70s and 80s um, having very devastating effects to uh, Afghans and Afghanistan, even up to today in 2021. Um, I think one of the things to be very uh, mindful of is that, you know, with the start of the occupation in the Bush era, um, you know, George W. Bush essentially starting the war um, for 9-11, essentially, to, to retaliate for that. One of the things that I don't think people realize is that once the bombing and, um, you know, the full-scale attack of the United States onto Afghanistan and Taliban factions in 2001 and 2002, the Taliban actually was like, listen, we will surrender Osama bin Laden if you stop the violence. And the Bush administration actually decided against that and said, no, we're going to continue our own campaign because they had their own motivations for the war and the occupation. And so that essentially ended up having a dramatic effect because we saw a 20 year occupation. Um, you know, things became gradually better in Afghanistan, I would say, in some respects for civil society. You know, you had a whole 20 years of folks that were living and born and living in a Taliban free society. But what ended up happening, what quickly came crumbling down, as we saw in the last uh, couple of weeks and months, is that the Trump administration essentially legitimized the Taliban. And so in this 20 year period, there was no real U.S. strategy to ensure that the Taliban would never again gain power. And unfortunately, that was very much underestimated by the United States. And it includes, you know, Pakistan's involvement in this that I don't think is necessarily talked about enough, especially in mainstream media. There is still to this day a link between the Taliban and Pakistan. I mean, you have the prime minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, talking about what the Taliban wants and what you know their agenda sort of is. And that's very interesting to see as, um, as Afghans, because it's something that we've always consistently said, like, hey, you know, there is a level of meddling by the neighboring Pakistan, but not necessarily addressed by any country, especially the United States. And now we see it even more with the fall of the Afghan government um, and, you know, the Taliban taking power. We have, you know, diplomats from Pakistan being one of the first ones to go to the capital and meet with Taliban officials, which is very, very, um, you know, drastic in terms of the level of support that Pakistan has been doing in the 70s and 80s. It was much more undercover, it was sort of under the table. But now we're seeing it full flown and there's really no repercussions for that. Um, when we look at what the last couple of months entailed with the withdrawal, I think one of the things to be very mindful of is that the Trump administration very much legitimized the Taliban. And so you had the United States directly negotiating with the Taliban and essentially cutting out the Afghan government entirely. There was no rep really real representation from the Afghan government, which by and large is representation from the people. And so what ended up happening, it set up the stage for the Biden administration to essentially abide by this policy, this peace uh, agreement with the Taliban, which is a little bit oxymoronic if you think about it. Um, but essentially, the Biden admin then took that and ran with it with really no proper foresight in terms of what would happen when they withdrew from Afghanistan with no real um, you know, foresight in terms of what would that mean for the Afghan army, what would that mean for the Afghan government, and first, and you know, out of everyone, for the Afghan people. And so what we saw was um, you know, the Afghan government essentially collapsing. We saw the Afghan army collapse. And a lot of times in the mainstream media, there's this narrative that the Afghan army gave up, they didn't want to fight anymore. And really what it, that boils down to is a lot of the operations of the Afghan army was based and dependent on U.S. support. 
And so you had uh, the, the US supporting them in aerial operations, you had them supporting ground operations that the Biden admin and Trump admin didn't really properly train and prepare them for. And so what we saw is essentially the Biden admin saying, hey, we're done. We're gonna back off of this. Whatever happens, happens. And what we ended up seeing in, in August is the complete collapse of the Afghan government. The army, the Afghan army quickly lost all of their footing in various parts of the country. And the Taliban came with full force. And so now when you fast forward to today, you see uh, the country that's entirely controlled by the Taliban. The, the two weeks or so um, leading up to the 31st deadline, the August 31st deadline by the United States was complete and utter chaos. I mean, we had um, myself personally, I had family members who are US citizens that could not get through to the airport because of Taliban, Taliban checkpoints. And so in that time frame of this chaos, a lot of Afghan Americans, such as myself, my organization, Afghans for Better Tomorrow, and across the diaspora, we were pushing hard for the Biden admin to create some sort of um, security perimeter so that folks had a chance to get to the airport and leave. Unfortunately, tens of thousands of um, eligible visa holders that were Afghan that in some capacity helped either the United States government or other foreign governments were not able to get through. And so to this day, I actually have relatives that are US citizens that were still not able to leave the country. And so they're trying to figure that out. To this day, there are still approximately anywhere between 65,000 to 100,000 SIV visa holders that are eligible to come to the United States that are still trapped inside of Afghanistan. And that becomes an incredibly dire and critical situation because unfortunately, and you know, to add um, even more blunders to, to this withdrawal, the Biden administration ended up giving a list full of you know, uh, folks that were trying to leave the country, visa holders, U.S. citizens and stuff like that to the Taliban, thinking that the Taliban for some odd reason would let them go through to the airport, but that never happened. And so now what we're seeing actively in real time is anyone that has any sort of affiliation with either the, the Afghan, the past Afghan government, any affiliation with the United States are essentially being hunted down. And so they're being essentially, um, you know, going, the Taliban are going door to door asking friends, family members where these people are. And what we're seeing is executions of folks that were in the Afghan government, folks that were in the Afghan National Army, folks that assisted the United States in some various ways. So that ranges from you know, military personnel, um, engineers that worked with um, you know, US funded organizations for infrastructure, really a broad range of individuals. And unfortunately, nothing seems to get better um, and we're, what we see in real time is just a catastrophic failure of policy that spans, you know, as far back as 40 to 45 years. I, I so appreciate the fact that you took that step back past, you know, the, the past two decades and going back 45 uh, years, you know, that depth is really important. And that is absolutely one of the things that's lacking um, in the, the conversations here, both the public conversations and the policy conversations. One of the things that um, your group, Afghans for a Better Tomorrow, is um, really calls attention to is, um, you know, on one hand, you talk about the future for all Afghans, for the Afghan people in Afghanistan, for the diaspora, um, you know, and so on. And at the same time, you make sure to call special attention to the fact that there are some who are more vulnerable than others. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about that, actually, if you could talk about how, it, you know, in, you, you know, you were just describing, so first of all, there are folks who are, you know, Taliban has, has lists of people uh, that they can go after. And there's also, um, there, there are various groups, you know, within Afghanistan who face special, uh, you know, vulnerabilities. I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. And so the vulnerable groups in Afghanistan, I would say first and foremost, are the LGBTQ community in Afghanistan. They are, um, you know, actively in safe houses, you know, trying to find, a, you know, a place of safety, uh, just because the Taliban are not friendly to um, that community. There's also religious and ethnic minorities within Afghanistan that are facing um, extra scrutiny and violence by the Taliban, uh, and this is something that we saw in the 90s. This is not anything new. Um, and that's you know something I definitely want to hit home here is because oftentimes we have uh, folks that say, oh no, the Taliban are reformed, they're changed. 
but their actions definitely point otherwise. We're seeing um, you know, religious minorities who are of the Shia Muslim faith being targeted. We're seeing ethnic minorities, um, Hazaras that are being uh, targeted. And actually Amnesty International just recently reported that 13 um, Hazara, uh, members of the Hazara community, which is an, an, an ethnic uh, uh, community inside of Afghanistan, who have historically been persecuted, were actually executed by the Taliban. And that's not uh, sort of an outlier, that's become quickly the norm across Afghanistan. And that's sort of um, what has gripped the entire nation in terms of the, the absolute cruel violence that the Taliban is starting to really uh, push forward. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, all right, we'll, we'll talk more about Afghanistan um, in, in tonight. Um, I wanna turn to Dr. Amani Ode. Uh, who is a lifelong resident of the Silwan neighborhood in Jerusalem um, and is an activist there and is a dentist there um, and is organizing people there. And, um, you know, we've been talking so far about Haitians and Afghans, many of whom face displacement um, in their home countries and are seeking refuge elsewhere. The Palestinian struggle has always um, and in kind of especially emphasize the right to return to homes that Palestinians have been displaced from since 1948 and before through Israeli violence um, and has asserted the right to remain in homes where Palestinians currently live. Throughout Palestine, Palestinians are facing legal measures, the violence of the Israeli defense forces and police uh, and of Israeli settlers all seeking to force them from their homes. This year, uh, the Jerusalem neighborhoods of Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan in particular have been in the spotlight, both as places where Israel is working to force many Palestinians out, but also where Palestinians are resisting these measures. So I was wondering if we could start uh, by just having you talk about what's happening in Silwan uh, in particular, both in terms of what Israel is trying to do and what resistance looks like. Uh, hello for everyone. Thank you for this uh, uh, this invitation to talk more about what ha is happening in uh, Jerusalem and in Siwan uh, especially. Uh, I'm sorry that I am I can't uh, open the camera because I have a, a low uh, internet connection. So I, I am trying to to save the internet for the talk. Uh, I am from Siwan. Siwan uh, is at the east side of Jerusalem. And it's a, a village with 13 neighborhood uh, inside the, the, the village. Silwan is a, a big uh, village with uh, uh, almost uh, uh, around uh, 16,000 people who live inside Silwan. And uh, uh, it, uh, we have uh, different cases in, in each neighborhood. One of uh, the neighborhood is the neighborhood that I live uh, inside it. Uh, it's Al Bustan neighborhood. Uh, it's uh, around uh, 100 family that have a uh, demolishing orders for all the houses uh, in the neighborhood. So the entire neighborhood is going to be demolished if uh, uh, if the municipality of uh, Israeli uh, consists to, to demolish those houses. Of course, they said that we have no permissions uh, for uh, our houses to be built in, in the lands, but some of the houses here are built uh, from uh, more than 15 years uh, before now, and we inherited it from our grandfathers and the grand-grandfathers. Uh, uh, we have a legal and a, an engineering uh, committee uh, that work to have a plan for uh, the whole uh, neighborhood but each time uh, in the court they refuse uh, the plan that we do that we did as people living in uh, in Al in Al Bustan neighborhood and they refuse to give us the permission to uh, to to create what uh, what we we need uh, more in uh, in, in our neighborhood to have a, a safe and good environment in order to, to continue living in Jerusalem. Uh, the main problem that uh, if people here uh, uh, go and live outside uh, Jerusalem, we will lose our uh, uh, Israeli IDs because it's uh, forbidden to be live 
uh, outside of Jerusalem. And if we stay in, in Jerusalem, we have no right to have houses and no right to, to build houses because they, uh, they don't give permissions for Palestinian people. So we, we are uh, standing in the middle of uh, having no house and having no identity for us as Palestinian people uh, living inside Jerusalem. Uh, this is not a, a problem for only Al Bustan neighborhood because also there is another neighborhood in Silwan called Patn al Hawa, and it's almost uh, 80 houses that they have to be uh, evac evac evacuated from the people who live inside it because they claim that those houses are a, ba a bust. The uh, properties for Jewish people who live uh, inside Palestine before 100 years, and now they are uh, they are uh, are uh, saying that uh, those uh, properties should be uh, getting back for the people who lived before 100 years in Palestine. So uh, this is another case. Another case is the uh, Wadi Hilwa neighborhood. Uh, under the entire neighborhood, there is um, uh, digging for uh, uh, architectures uh, and uh, uh, tunnels that are being prepared under the neighborhood. So uh, the entire neighborhood is in danger uh, to be demolished in, in, uh, in any condition, even if a small earthquake come to, to this area, it will demolish all the houses that uh, in the, in the area, and uh, they, uh, they they have no permission to to uh, create better conditions for their ha those houses, as the municipality uh, forbidden them to do any uh, building or any uh, uh, extra work in the in the area there. Um, those uh, how, those neighborhoods that we are talking about, uh, we are talking about uh, more than seven thousand people who live uh, in different neighborhood. Around six neighborhood of the thirteen neighborhood in Silwan have uh, demolition orders or evacuation orders or uh, uh, in danger to be demolished because of the conditions around them. And because of uh, all of uh, these conditions, we have uh, 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 always clashes with the uh, with the, the the police in the, in the area, and we have uh, even arresting for the little children who who are uh, arresting from uh, the schools and arresting from the streets while they are uh, playing. And uh, those problems arise from uh, the the fact that people here in in Silwan do not uh, uh, feel safe and do not have a, a good uh, environment in order uh, uh, to live a, a normal life and in order to to have a fair uh, life to have a house and to have a safe environment to to uh, to bring their uh, children to to a good life for them. Wow. Um, well, that's that's so helpful and um, and very heartbreaking. You know, there's one thing that you said that especially struck me, which is this: what sounds like an impossible position that you're put into. As so, if you leave Jerusalem, then you lose your status but you're also not allowed to stay in Jerusalem. And so it's this untenable, impossible um, solution. And, um, you know, there's something that is so unique to Palestine about that and the kind of ways that Israel is pushing Palestinians. And also there's something about it that really resonates when I think about people who are put in these impossible situations. If you leave, you lose your status, but it's impossible to stay. Um, so this is, this is really powerful. I wonder if you can talk about the kind of protest that uh, is also taking place in, in Silwan and in, in Jerusalem, throughout Jerusalem, because you know, the reason why you know, all the way here in North America, we know the name Silwan is because people are fighting back. Um, and so I wonder what what does uh, what does that look like? Um, 
and yeah, but both in Suwan and, and, and throughout Jerusalem, what does what does protest look like? Yeah, we, we started what, what is known now as a protest tents. Uh, those tents work in order to, to have uh, the, the international pressure and the solidarity from all over the world. And, and also we, we create pages on Instagram and Facebook and uh, we have the uh, Safe Silwan campaign in order to have uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the strong uh, international pressure that we, we needed in order uh, to, uh, to raise the awareness of people of what's happening in Silwan and what's happening every day uh, from the violation from the municipality and from the police toward people who live in those areas and in Jerusalem uh, as all. And uh, those protest uh, tents are uh, not a, a new way for protesting. Uh, we, we have the first protest tent in 2005. Until now, we have activities uh, as a daily uh, basis uh, in order to, uh, to create um, a, a special uh, communication between us and between uh, people who, who have uh, attention for what's happening inside Jerusalem. And uh, we succeed uh, once at 2008 to, to, to have Hillary Clinton in, in our protest tent. And she succeeded to freeze the, the demolishing order in uh, Al-Bustan for 10 years. And now we are trying to do this again because we have uh, only freezed uh, the, the court uh, till February. Uh, the, and and after February we are facing the demolishing again. So now we are trying to have a, a strong uh, international international pressure, and to have uh, advocacy around the world in order to to uh, our, uh, way, way to to raise the awareness of people in order to to know more about uh, people who live inside those. Uh, areas and not to be only numbers and to, to, to start to be more stories uh, for people to know that those people have hope that they have dreams and they have uh, stories for their lives and they uh, uh, they uh, have the right to be in in those lands and this is a, a right for them to 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 have a free a space and to and to have a safe homes. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Dr. Romani. We'll, um, we'll come back and continue talking about Palestine. I want to um, just get our last uh, panelist to, to be able to make some opening remarks and opening responses to some questions. And that is Josue uh, de Luna Navarro, um, who is a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies. And um, Josue, this year, um, we've seen many catastrophic climate change driven disasters around the world and here in North America. Um, I, but I, but I, I also know that, um, you know, there's something very visible about a hurricane or a wildfire, but I know that climate change um, and kind of environmental destruction is producing displacement in ways that might be less dramatic and less visible. And I, I wonder if you could talk um, more generally about what kind of, in what ways does climate change um, displacing people. Sure. Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Josue. Um, I'm a former undocumented immigrant here in the U.S. I immigrated when I was nine years old with my parents uh, who decided to give up everything, right? Because they had, they didn't see any other choice for our family to continue living in our home country and they decided to cross the border. And, uh, you know, my family story is one of many, 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 many uh, parents and people who get to that moment that they decide that they have to immigrate from their home countries. Um, just like how everyone was saying this uh, panel, there's many reasons, right? There's not just one root cause that influences someone to decide or have the need and be forced to be displaced from, from their home countries. And in the case of, for example, uh, my story, right, which is not very unique in the sense that it's a very common story that you see throughout Latin America, right? 
the fact that one, uh, Latin America, we have societies that when you're born poor, you're going to die even poorer, right? And it's something that for generations, uh, even our grandparents have known, right? That even, uh, for example, in my case, it was, you know, different generations trying to immigrate actually to the US, right? And, you know, being in, ended up being deported through different mechanisms, right? Of back then, policies that will attract people to migrate for either economic reasons or safety reasons, and then other policies pushing them out of, of, the, of the US. But something that you know influences and leads up to the conversation around the climate crisis and migration is ecological destruction, right? Uh, for example, where I'm, where I'm born, Torreón, Coahuila, uh, the, the last time that I was able to visit where I was born after 16 years of not being able to cross back to where, to where my family's from, you know, you realize that a lot of our home countries have been sacrifice zones. Sacrifice zones from American, Canadian, European corporations going into Latin America and destroying the land for their own profit, right? So you have uh, mining companies, you have huge beer corporations extracting water in a place like, for example, where I'm born, that it's a desert. Uh, it's the ongoing story, right, of colonialism that our home countries have experienced. Uh, from, again, mining companies to extraction for oil to fracking. It is the ongoing global north corporations going into our home countries, one, destroying the land, poisoning our resources. And then with that, you have U.S. intervention going in and intervening with economics, intervening militarily into our home countries, um, and then to put another layer, right? In a lot of our home countries, a lot of our families have been uh, victims of the byproduct of the drug war, right? That we all know that, you know, it's all being production and crisis being produced by the US, right? So for example, in my story, it, it's not, it wasn't just the economic portion nor the ecological part of the realization that you know, our families were living in poison, in air that was contaminated by all these industries, by with water that was contaminated by all these industries. But it was also the realization that uh, we started seeing glimpses, right, of when the drug war got out of control in throughout Latin America, especially in Mexico, uh, that it was different factors that leads not just my family, but families now uh, across Latin America that they see now they escape them to migrate, right? They see now they escape when one, you see your family members getting sick from all this poison from uh, corporations. When you see violence in the streets, when you see that the economic situation is never gonna get better, when you, when you then you put the layer of the racism and classism that our home countries have, it takes a lot, right, for someone to decide that there is no other choice than to migrate, regardless of what that journey is, right? Regardless if it means traveling throughout Central America to get to the U.S.-Mexican border, regardless if it means whether you have the pathway to get tourist visa or you have to cross the border through the desert. I think it's important to know, to let people know, whoever is you know, watching this live, uh, is that you know, our families don't migrate because they want to, right? They migrate because they're forced to, right? They migrate because there is no other escape to all these crises that was generated by the global north, right? It's not that you know there's people that wake up and they're like you know what i want to be when i grow up an immigrant no the reality is that the the need to survive and to give a better future for your future generations 
requires you to migrate, right? Regardless if it's an economic crisis, a climate crisis, these are political forces, right? That either pull or push people out uh, in terms of migration. And what we're seeing now, right, is this trend, right? That with everything that has happened in the history from the very first time that white people came to this side of the world and started colonizing our people and putting borders, right? Which was a function to colonize, which therefore was also a function that we cannot talk about without talking about race. Since then, up to now with all the interventions and the now what we're seeing a worsening climate crisis. The global north has manufactured this machine, right? This machine that makes profit out of people and immigrants. And how they make profit is through incarceration and deportation, right? All based under the lens of racism, right? So it's no coincidence that we recently just saw uh, migrants from Haiti being violently kept away from getting safety. It's no coincidence that while black and brown immigrants are trying to find safety not only for themselves, but for their children and future generations, there's a whole border complex that one has connections with Israel, right? And also has, uh, has developed technology to keep specifically black and brown people from crossing the border. And it's no coincidence at the same time, you know, the US accepts white Europeans coming, you know, in the, in the ages of the pandemic. Uh, when that was happening, there was news that they had lifted with the restrictions of European uh, visitors coming to the US. In other words, as the climate crisis gets worsened, we can only expect this border apparatus to grow even stronger and create more anti-immigrant laws and put more violence to black and brown immigrants because that has been always the function of border control. That has always been the function of ICE and CBP is to keep the people who the US thinks is worthless of finding safety out and keeping the status quo, in this case, light-skinned immigrants welcoming to the US. And I think that's uh, you know, a further discussion to talk about, right? Which is the, the function that race has with, with immigration and, and the need, right? That not only as we move forward and start addressing the systems of oppression, is not just solely about creating new systems of migration, right? It's not about just creating new categories of refugees or new categories of visas, even though that could be steps, right, to the bigger vision of liberation for our people, uh, that shouldn't be solely the, the, the solution, right? Because we all know that the big solution is that we don't need this border control. We don't need CBP and ICE, and that those systems of Migration control should be abolished, not only in, in the US-Mexican border, but all the sets of borders that the US has funded throughout Central America. Wow, okay, so, so much to say. First of all, just before I forget, folks who are, um, who are uh, watching um, on Zoom, if you have a question for panelists, please go ahead and put it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen so we can get that in the next part of our conversation. Um, and uh, I already see, see one in there, so we'll get to that. Um, uh, wow, Josue, you know, as you're talking about, first of all, I appreciate how everybody is going deep with the history tonight, you know, and we're talking about what's happening in 2021, but we know that what's happening this year <laughs> started well before this year. Um, and I appreciate you putting on the table that when we're talking about you know, environmental destruction, it's not just about, you know, the current situation of climate change, but that requires a, a, a longer conversation around colonialism. And I'm thinking about, I'm listening to your words about the colonization of the Americas, and also thinking about what Dr. Amani just said about the colonization of Palestine, like that these are two, maybe at different, um, different phases, but the same kind of uh, uh, dynamic. Um, 
I, I had a question about the last thing that you said, Josue, uh, which was about you know the solution to the solution to displacement is not just to create new categories of um, of status, you know, whether refugee status or otherwise. And I wonder, you know, I know that you have a critique of the conversation around climate refugee, and I wonder is is is, is that is that your critique? And if so, if so, can you say more about that? Because I think that there are some who kind of celebrate like the fact that, you know, in institutions like the UN, there's a conversation about climate refugees, right? And that, that's like, oh, look, we're, we're acknowledging climate change and taking it seriously. Um, but I wonder if you can say a bit more about what you, were, what you were saying about the inadequacy or the limitations of these conversations around migration and refugeehood. Um, well, one, I definitely think that trying to create a new category of refugee, in this case, a climate refugee, I'm not trying to say that it's bad, right? I think it's good. I think any progress or forward steps, right, to the big vision of liberation that I was talking about, it has its merit and it's good. And, you know, people will uh, take advantage, right, of those opportunities to find ways of migration. My critique is the the fact that that shouldn't be the only way, right? that shouldn't be the only solution to this complex problem that not only, uh, you know, that the world is facing currently. What I'm trying to say is that the system of migration, specifically the system of migration to the US has always historically been around race, right? And so when you try to work around a system that is foundation has been around race of keeping those who are not white out of finding safety to the US, you notice that throughout history, there has been groups who have been granting the privilege to find a way to migrate in what uh, you know, Fox News will say the right way. Um, creating new systems of migration in a way the narrative reinforces that, right? That there's a right way to migrate, right? That, you know, those people that are trying to find a new life or trying to find new opportunities from earthquake, if they cross the border without inspection or without already a refugee category, then they're not doing the right way. When in reality, what is the right way? when borders have been a system of colonizations from the first place, you know? So like, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking with one of my uh, brothers uh, who are from, the, uh, from Standing Rock. And when we were in ceremony, you know, he pointed out something very interesting, right? That way back ago, when the white man hadn't invaded this part of the world and colonized, there was already a communication between the Lakota people and people from the Mexica people, right? And that they had, you know, been constantly sharing medicine. And that could be one of the reasons why we both have either a sweat lodge and a temascal, very similar medicine, right? Way back when borders weren't even a thing. So when borders were created in this systems of migration that chooses, oh, you're worthy of finding safety and you're not, when we try to work around that system, we're only reinforcing the idea that some are worthy and there is a right way to migrate, right? And by reinforcing the fact that creating a climate refugee category is the only way to solve this issue of mass migration uh, because of the climate crisis is not really seeing and analyzing the problem through a critical race lens, right? Is not realizing that this system has a very racist foundation in its first place. That even though it would be good to have a category because people would find safety through that category, the big vision that we should be striving for is a future where we don't have borders. A future that looks very like Europe that has no borders, that doesn't have that strict border control, a future that 
I would just like it allows people for, to move from California to New Mexico because of wildfires without no restriction of trying to find a visa. That's the future that our home countries and the global south deserves, right? A future where when they need to migrate, it doesn't matter what the reason is to justify the freedom of movement to find safety uh, for themselves and for our future generations. And so just to recap, my, my answer is, it's good, right? That we're thinking about all these new ways to play around the system, uh, but it should not keep us away from envisioning and realizing that the system has been put very strategically to put black and brown people outside of safety. And that the future that we should envision is a system that ensures the freedom of movement for our people, regardless of what the reason is that they have to move. In a future where we abolish ICE and CBP. Beautiful. Um, and um, uh, yes, that, that's lovely. And if I could add to, you know, a future to where people um, can stay when they, you know, also don't have to move, right? Um, I want to I want to take off. Um, just uh, okay. First of all, thank you all for an amazing panel. So much on the table, and um, you know, again, so much uh, in terms of the different kind of conditions of displacement. Um, those fighting to move, those fighting to stay, uh, you know, those fighting to return. And um, I wanted to turn back to Halima uh, and, you know, go off of one thing that Josue was saying, you know, because you offered, Josue offered this deep critique of borders themselves and of the whole question of um, different statuses assigned to different people based on where you happen to be located, when and how you cho choose to migrate, et cetera. Um, and uh, from that flows this notion of migrating the right way and the wrong way, right? And so on one hand, you know, that whole entire foundation <laughs> is, is, is problematic, you know, for, for the reasons that Josue said, I really agree. Also, you know, I think in August this year, we saw many Afghan people trying to come here the so-called right way <laughs> um, through, you know, visa programs. And yet, uh, you know, the so-called right way was hardly um, an easy way. And I know that Halima, you uh, and Afghans for a Better Tomorrow and a number of other uh, organizations, particularly, you know, organizations of Afghans located here have been working really hard to help people come here. And I wonder if you could just say a word about what that has been like. I mean, we've heard things about um, people having applied for these visas a long time ago and not having received them. We've heard about various steps in um, the, the process. We've heard about the cost of visas. So I wonder if you could say a word about that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the things that um, is really almost a level of violence as, as well against uh, Afghans and, and more broadly, I think anyone who is outside of the United States is um, this notion of value. And I say that because a lot of Afghans that were offered these, you know, SIV visas, or these P1 and P2 classification visas, were folks that in some way contributed to helping the United States, right? And so you're immediately placing value on an Afghan life based on how much they've helped the United States. And what we're seeing now, and this is much in the same vein, is we're seeing all these, you know, welcome Afghan refugee organizations that are popping up. And, you know, a lot of their framework and messaging is around, oh, well, we're going to accept Afghan refugees for what they can contribute to the United States and what they can contribute as working people as all of this versus simply for the humanitarian aspect of safety and refuge. Um, so that's definitely one point that I want to hit home. I think, secondly, there's so many layers of bureaucracy that has plagued Afghanistan and folks that are applying for these visas that you know you've ha you have folks that are waiting in limbo for many many years and leading up to the withdrawal a lot of organizations across conservative ends the democratic uh and were pushing for an expedited process for folks that had assisted in some way to the united states the united states military to get these folks out as i mentioned before there's anywhere between sixty-five thousand to 100 000 eligible folks 
with either an, uh, a visa in process or already granted that visa that have no way to leave Afghanistan now that the country is in the hands of the Taliban. So I think that's one layer of it. A second layer is now that the country has fallen to the Taliban, there is a pathway to potentially reach the United States through the humanitarian parole application. The problem with this is it's $575 per application. And that's anybody from two years old and older. And so you, you know, when looking at it in the framework of most Afghans that are inside of Afghanistan live on, I would say 10 to $15 a month, okay? And so you're asking folks to pay $575 um, for one person for this one application that could potentially provide some level of a pathway to reach the United States. It doesn't even provide a visa. It doesn't provide asylum. It just allows you to potentially reach the United States. So that's very cost prohibitive. It is a form of violence for a very vulnerable population right now that are in this situation currently because of failed US policy. So that's one um, aspect of it as well. I think another thing in relation to um, visas is now that the country has collapsed, um, there's really no, there's no US embassy for folks to get anything processed. Their passports are now technically not, you know, their original Afghan passports are technically not of any um, recognized government because the government collapsed. And so there's many layers of bureaucracy. There's many layers of hardships that now the Afghan people face to even attempt to find safety and refuge. Wow, thank you. Um, Halima, we have a question for you here too from Phyllis Bennis, my colleague Phyllis Bennis at IPS, um, uh, which feels really timely. So I'm just gonna read it. Some parts of our movement are calling for economic sanctions against the Taliban government in Afghanistan. We're saying that access to, the ta to, ta to Afghanistan's own funds, which are now frozen, should not be released and that the IMF and World Bank loans should be denied, at least until the Taliban government shows support for women's rights. Others of us remain very concerned that economic sanctions will always end up hurting the people uh, much more than any government. How do you uh, weigh in on this issue? How do you weigh in on the issue of US sanctions and how should it be resolved? Uh, great question. I think it's a bit of a double-edged sword at this point in time. Um, I think one of the things to note is that the Taliban in some shape or some form has had sanctions applied against them for many years. It's not been very effective. And I think we see that sanctions are not necessarily effective in regime change. It's not necessarily very effective in um, getting the gov any government to do what you know the U.S. supposedly wants them to do. I mean, we have many examples with Cuba, with Iran. Um, and so we know that sanctions don't necessarily work. Of course, it becomes very complicated when you want to release cash reserves to a, an organization that is essentially it are terrorists that are um, uh, violent against uh, many uh, vulnerable populations, women, children, uh, religious and ethnic minorities. And so it becomes, uh, you know, it could be, it's very valid to say, no, we should not release these funds to the Taliban government. In the same vein though, you know, and this is what I mean by double-edged sword, if these cash reserves via the IMF and the World Bank are not released, you run the risk of a starving country, you run the risk of hospitals not being able to run. And so what you'll end up seeing is a humanitarian catastrophe more severe than what we're seeing right now. And so I think that one of the approaches of releasing these funds with very much like stringent um, you know, implications or, or stringent guidelines or guardrails would be very beneficial um, because what, what ends up happening is, as Phyllis mentioned, the people will suffer the most. And so we're already seeing a level of starvation happening already. And so by withholding funds, that will only get worse. Hospitals will not have supplies. Folks will not have food on the table. And what we'll end up seeing is massive starvation and death. Okay, thank you, Halima. Um, I wanna turn back to Dr. Mania Ode um, and talking about the situation in Jerusalem. And it's actually been, you know, I was thinking again about Palestine uh, while listening to Josue and listening uh, to Halima and the different, um, the various ways that people are displaced and, um, you know, Dr. O'Day, I wonder if you could say a bit more about the measures that Israel is taking to displace folks. You, you talked about some of the, the legal um, 
measures, the way that Israel is using legal power to basically say that people have no right to um, your homes in Silwan. Um, you know, I also know that Israel has this combination, uses this combination of armed forces and also settlers, uh, settler violence to displace people. And the last thing, you know, um, Halima was just talking about a humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan um, in terms of a lack of health care, uh, you know, because those systems are, are, are in serious crisis. Uh, you know, those things, the, the collapse of institutions like that are forces that, that make, that displace people. Similarly, um, Jacqueline Charles, the journalist, uh, was talking about the real um, social crisis in Haiti uh, that also makes Haitians uh, want to leave or have to leave. And I wonder, um, you know, Israel also, you know, how do I say this? They allow certain services, um, they allow more services in, in Jewish areas than they do in uh, Palestinian areas. And I just, I wonder if you could just say a, a bit more about the different ways that Israel is, is trying to make uh, life you know, difficult in Silwan. Um, so uh, those those steps that Israeli government is taking toward demolishing homes or evictions comes within a grand uh, scheme in or in order to increase the number of settlers uh, in the Arab part of the city. So uh, this will will change the geographical uh, expansion of the occupation plan in 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 the Arab side, and it uh, and this also will will change the de demographic uh, um, expansion of the Arab character of the area. Uh, the argument they, that they always give uh, giving us uh, for the lack of uh, license or the planning for the neighborhoods are totally illogical because since uh, uh, we have legal and engineering committees presented us to, to organize those neighborhoods. So they, they have to give us the right in order to, uh, uh, to, to build and in order to, to have those plans in, in the area. So every time they rejected it, they, they use a, not only the, the legal part of the rejection, also they uh, use the settlers who are now living between us in order to have uh, um, to, 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 to have no safe environment for people who, who live here and uh, to increase the uh, violence in, 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 the, in the area. All, all these conditions is dragging the, the, the Arab sites and dragging the people who live here to more violence and to more problems. And uh, it's uh, detected that uh, each time those uh, reactions from people come because uh, they don't have the, uh, the right to, to, to have the same rights as Jewish people who live in Jerusalem. So, uh, uh, being in, in Jerusalem, that's mean uh, as we have the international law that till now Jerusalem is under occupation. So they don't have the right to uh, apply the Israeli law in Jerusalem for the Palestinian people. But we see that they uh, don't apply uh, the uh, law uh, in the Jewish people. They only, uh, or not in Jewish, because it's, it's not a... a, a I think related to the religion, it's more political thing. So I, I will uh, call them uh, to the Israeli people, but they use the, the, the law against the Palestinian people who live in Jerusalem in order uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to demolish uh, anything related to the Arab sites. And this is, is totally not a humanity, not a human and not justice for people here. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Romani. Um, I'm going, we're, we are, this is, <laughs> I, could, I could really talk to you all, all night. Um, and um, we're really kind of expanding uh, these notions of displacement in big ways and in deep ways. Uh, but we are coming to a close.
for our um, webinar. I um, want to acknowledge that Dr. Amani Ode is up late. It's, it's quite late in Palestine, so I really appreciate her especially. Um, so I will uh, momentarily give uh, panelists an opportunity to offer some final closing thoughts. Um, and before we do that, I just want to make a few announcements. So one, just to say, like I said, this is the first in a four-part series um, uh, that we're organizing here at IPS uh, on displacement, migration, uh, borders, and resistance. The next one, look forward to the next one uh, with Ofrene, which is an organization of Garifuna people, Black and Indigenous people of Central America. Ofrene is an organization based in uh, Honduras in particular. Uh, they are recipients of IPS's uh, Latelier Moffitt Human Rights Awards, uh, which are happening this year and are happening next week. Uh, and this conversation will take place next week on Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, so uh, please look out for that on the IPS events page. Uh, I also want to announce actually just later tonight, uh, Code Pink, uh, our, our movement friends Code Pink, are doing uh, a, another webinar at eight o'clock Eastern on Haitian, the situation of Haitian migrants in particular. Uh, and they have, among other people, the co-director of the organization Haitian Bridge, uh, one of the leading organizations uh, that has been organizing relief and support for Haitian folks uh, working to migrate. So you can check out codepink.org uh, for that. Um, I wanna shout out uh, the website of Halima's organizations, um, uh, organization Afghans for a Better Tomorrow. Um, the organization website is weareafghans.org. Um, so check that out. And the last thing is I want to shout out a protest that's actually happening in Washington DC uh, next week uh, you know, uh, for, for climate justice um, that colleagues at IPS are helping to uh, organize. And so you can go to build back fossil free dot org uh, and check out a coalition of organizations that is organizing a set of uh, of actions days of action uh, for climate justice in Washington DC it's at IPS you know we believe that it really takes movement pressure movement resistance to actually achieve social change and policy change so please check that out um, so with that I would love to turn Turn it back to um, our panelists for some from some closing thoughts. And if I could start with you, Halima. Uh, well, I first want to thank IPS for um, you know hosting this and and giving um, this platform on on this type of discussion. I don't think it happens very often, so thank you so much, IPS, um, Phyllis, Curry. Like, just it's been great so far. Um, you know, in terms of just final thoughts on my end, um, you know, one of the things that I think is very critically important is to not forget Afghanistan. I know that um, a lot of folks in mainstream media are no longer focused on what's going on on the day to day basis there. And much of the US political sphere has also moved on from it as well. Um, much like they've done in the past with withdrawal from Vietnam and, and you know, other situations of just war and violence ending abruptly and then, you know, folks moving on from the national discourse on it. And so one of the things that I do want to hit home is that uh, one of the other orgs that I've co-founded, Afghans, um, the Afghan Diaspora for Equality and Progress, we've actually just launched a social media campaign to urge the Biden administration to waive the humanitarian parole application fee. Again, that's $575, which, you know, is, is pretty ridiculous for, um, you know, folks that live on way less than that per month. Um, and so we're hoping that we can gain some traction there. And, you know, if anyone is interested in it, I can definitely share additional information. Uh, we have a toolkit and all of that. So uh, that's just, you know, I, I guess my, uh, the, the best thing I can say at this moment in time. And thank you again to IPS. Beautiful, thank you so much, um, Josue. Uh, well, first, yeah, thank you, Curry uh, and everyone in the panel. Uh, I always learn so much. Um, it really, it's 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 truly a blessing, right? To uh, you know, listen to other people and the other people's experience, right? And know that you know, in a way, we all have the same perspective, right? And the same experience, collective experience, when we're talking about the displacement and um, throughout the world. Uh, my last remarks will be one, I think it's critical to acknowledge that a lot of these crises that our people 
are being forced to dis to move away from, or that this crisis have displaced people, have root on the global north, right? Uh, have root on this countries that its power has been founded on colonialism and racism and capitalism have been the same ones who have generated all of this displacement. And if we really wanted a future, right, where we ensure you know, our people's freedom to move and stay, I think it's critical for those countries to acknowledge the harm that they've done and their role in creating all of this, right? Uh, and continue to perpetuate all of the crises that you know people experience in their everyday lives that are only factors, right? That pushes someone to see, you know, in, migrating as the only way out. Um, and two, it's critical for our movements to be grounded on a future where we truly ensure that the freedom to move and stay uh, is granted to all of our people, right? That we don't throw people under the bus, right? As we try to address all of these complexities, that our movements have, are grounded on the, on the future that as we try to you know, address a certain type of, uh, of migration, right, through visas and all these different mechanisms, to realize, right, that as long as we play in this system, the same forms of racism are going to be perpetuated in different ways, right? And to, uh, for our movements to be brave, right? And have the courage to envision a future where we don't have to depend on those systems again. Uh, and we create our own systems that actually work for our people and not for um, the people in power. And that's it. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, Dr. Amani, I think, you know, had technical issues and, and um, uh, had to, I think we lost the connection, but we're so grateful for her presence um, and so grateful for all of you, um, for Josue, for Halima, um, and for Jacqueline, uh, who, who also had to leave early. Um, so I just wanted to end with gratitude and shout outs. Um, shout out to my Coworkers at IPS, um, to my coworker Netfa behind the scenes, running tech, making sure that this thing uh, ran smoothly. Shout out to my coworker Sarah, who you know designed the beautiful promotional materials for this. Um, shout out to the Roxbury branch of the Boston Public Library, which has been streaming this on their uh, Facebook. Um, all, all very much appreciated. Uh, so serious gratitude to all of you. Uh, stay in touch, stay safe, and stand together in solidarity. Take care.